tonight as we study through the Bible. If we can serve you in any way, please see a person wearing a Calvary Chapel shirt. Now let's grab our Bibles and head into the sanctuary and hear what the Lord has to say to us tonight. All right, we welcome you tonight. Welcome those that have joined us on our live stream. We're excited that we get to open the Word of God one more time. Maybe the last time before the Lord returns. Amen. Who knows? But we're ready. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the Song of Solomon. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Well, Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity to open our Bibles together. And Lord, as we do, uh, as we turn the pages and open the scriptures, may our hearts and minds be open to what you want to say to us tonight. We, Lord, we know that there's a word that you have for each one of us. So Lord, prepare our hearts. Uh, cause us, Lord, to be attentive tonight. Clear our minds of distractions. And Lord, we thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. So Father, we pray now by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that you would bless both the speaking and the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Song of Solomon, a love story. And as you have been with us for the last few weeks uh, in looking at the first part of the Song of Solomon, there are several different ways that you can read the Song of Solomon. And the first and most obvious way is you read it as uh, a love story uh, between a man and a woman. Uh, and the expression of that love in marital bliss. And for many, that's all the Song of Solomon is, is a love story. But the ancient Jews looked at it as more than just the story of a man and woman in love. The ancient Jews looked at the Song of Solomon as the love story of God for the nation of Israel. And it was sung at Passover every year to remind the children of Israel of God's love for the nation. And since the beginning of the church, the Christian view of the Song of Solomon is that it is the love story between the bride and the bridegroom. That is the love of Jesus for his bride. And that's no surprise because Paul in his letter to the Ephesians would liken the marriage relationship, the husband and wife relationship to the relationship of Christ and the church. And yet even deeper than that, many see the Song of Solomon as an individual love story between the Lord and us. And this is just a good book to take somewhere and read the eight chapters and let the Lord speak to you about his amazing love for you. Uh, and sometimes I think we need to go back to the prayer of Paul when Paul says, I pray that you might know the height, the width, the breadth, and the depth of the love of God for the saints. And I can't tell you how many times we see in the New Testament a word that I've come to love. It's beloved. We are beloved in the saints. Uh, and so our position as we go through the Song of Solomon is to bring out the allegorical story of God's love for the church through Jesus Christ our Lord. And these expressions of love that we see in the Song of Solomon are a reminder to us of the love that Jesus has for each one of us. And in the days that we live in, we need to think more often and more longing about the love of God and the love that's been demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. And like the bride waiting for her groom, uh, we see the anticipation in the Song of Solomon of the Shulamite anticipating the coming 
of her king and her lover and her one that she adores. Chapter 3, if you were with us last, last week, is uh, a picture of the longing of the Shulamite for the coming of her king. Uh, he's going to be coming on this immensely beautiful uh, uh, palaquin, this couch, this with gold and silver all around it. This just beautiful way in which he is coming. She doesn't know quite when he will appear, but she is anticipating his appearing. Now, it doesn't take us any stretch of the imagination to say that that should be us in our longing for the appearing of our king. You know, we don't know when he's going to come. Hopefully soon. But there should be such a longing and a desire for our king to come. Uh, and I love the verse in Hebrews where it talks about that Jesus appeared the first time as a sacrifice for our sin. He will appear the second time for those who are looking for his appearing. And I you know, love the scriptures that, that says, lift up your eyes, your redemption is drawing near. Watch and be ready for an hour that you think not your king is coming. And so chapter 3 is a story of the Shulamite longing for the coming of her king. Uh, and you can particularly see that uh, beginning in verse 6 of chapter th uh, 3. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant power? power uh, powders. So you see her just you know, longing and looking for the coming of the one that she loved. And I kind of liken that to the days right before I got married. Looking forward to and longing for that day that we would be one, husband and wife. And just the anticipation that would grow. As I would mark the days off the calendar, you know, until that day approached. Would to God that we, the bride of Christ, would have that same kind of anticipation for the coming of our King. We profess in our songs and we profess in our conversations that we love the Lord. And if I were to ask you today, if you, know, if you loved the Lord, your response would be, yes, I love the Lord. But often that love is not expressed in our longing to see him. Oh, that I might see him. Oh, that I might behold him. For those of you that are reading through the Bible with us on our Calvary Chapel Bible reading schedule, we are reading through everybody's favorite book in the Old Testament, the book of Job. And as we are reading, I believe it was yesterday's reading, Job begins to cry out, oh, I wish I could see him. I wish that there was a man that could stand between us and I could express my, myself to him. I think somewhere along the line, we, the church, have lost our love for his coming. And now, even in the church today, it is very popular among some groups to believe that the Lord really isn't coming back. Uh, amillennialism is, is, is taking on a, a, a huge thing in the body of Christ. Well, that's the very thing Peter said would happen. Uh, he said where, th that there would arise in the last days those that would mock the idea of the coming of the Lord. And I'm glad that I was raised in a generation in the church. From the time that I got saved until this present day, in front of us for the last 50 years has been the love of the coming of Christ. You know, how soon we are. And yeah, I've been a Christian for over 50 years now, and the Lord hasn't come yet, but we're 50 years closer than when I first believed. And we are sooner than we believe. Uh, I, don't, I don't even want to talk about the events in the world that should be causing us to at least pay attention. All I'm asking you to do is have a longing in your heart for the coming of the Lord. 
for the coming of the king. You know, as you would long for the one that you love. Now, in chapter 4, yeah, the, the beloved, the groom, begins to speak. And he says in verse 4 and in verse 7, he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. And this isn't talking about fair in the sense that we think of the word fair. It is fair in that you are beautiful, something to be admired. And you know, that's the Lord looking at us and expressing his love for us. And then in, beginning in the, the latter part of verse 4, uh, all the way down through verse 6, uh, which we read last week. Uh, and I'll just mention, uh, and we'll pick it up in verse 7 tonight, is that these expressions of love uh, in verses uh, 2 through 6, the Lord or the, the groom declaring uh, to the bride these beautiful expressions of love. And with that, we made the application last week that if you are married, as a, a male, you should be expressing these kind of things to your wife. Yeah, I read about dove eyes and uh, you know beautiful hair and nice teeth and those kind of things that he mentions in the first six verses. You know, a husband ought to be able to tell his wife that she has beautiful hair. He ought to be able to tell his wife that she has beautiful eyes. I mean, he ought to be able to tell his wife that she is beautiful in appearance. Uh, and, and so there's some practical things that we could learn uh, just as husbands uh, and wives in the way we express our ourselves. And if I, I could say there's one fault common to most men in marriage relationships is that we are not very expressive in our love and adoration for our wives. But, you know, the, the, the groom now, the bridegroom, is expressing in, in terms that are a little foreign to us. You know, I, I don't want to tell my wife she has dove's eyes. I don't want to tell her her hair looks like a flock of goats coming down the mountains. I mean, these are just ways of expressing things in that culture uh, that they understood. Uh, so we ought to be expressing the same thing. But the application I want to, I want to carry a little further is, is that the Lord looks at you as a pure and spotless bride. I call your attention to verse 7. You know, when the bridegroom says, You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. You can go back and read in chapter 1 how she was a little self-effacing in chapter 1. I'm not that pretty. Yeah, I'm too dark. You know, I've been abused by my brothers. Uh, I have, I've worked too hard. At, but when he looks at her, all he sees is her beauty. And Paul makes the same analogy in Ephesians chapter 5. How will the bride be presented to Christ in Ephesians chapter 5? Without spot or wrinkle. And when the Lord looks at you and loves you, doesn't see all your failures and your mess ups, which is what we tend to see. He sees in us his own righteousness. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament probably I quote it more often than any just to remind myself God took him who knew no sin and made him sin on my behalf that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus how much more righteous do you get than Jesus so when God looks at you he sees the righteousness and I, I love this uh, my favorite benediction in the New Testament the book of Jude, now unto him who is able to present you somewhat scarred and marred before the throne, be glory, dominion, power forever and ever. Amen. That doesn't quite read that way, does it? 
Now unto him who is able to present you faultless before his throne. Be dominion, power, glory, forever and ever. Amen. You know, that, that you will stand before the throne of God, a pure, spotless bride. And there's even an Old Testament precedent for this. And this, this will, you know, be familiar to you. You all know the story of Balaam and the talking horse, way before Mr. Ed was popular on TV. But the talking donkey and the whole story of Balaam. But he goes out and Balak wants him to curse Israel. And Balaam stands on the mountain, not once, twice, but four times, and blesses the nation of Israel instead of cursing them. Now, I know you guys have already read the book of Numbers. And you've already know, read that, that there was a whole generation of people, over 620,000 men over the age of 20, who died in a 40-year period because of their rebellion against the Lord. And we also remember that there was not once, twice, but a few times that Moses looked at these people, his blood pressure went up, and he said, you stiff-necked and rebellious people. But yet when Balaam prophesied, behold, Israel, in whom I see no iniquity. Pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, that, that God would look at Israel after being in rebellion for 40 years and make that kind of statement. So when I read here in Psalm 4, verse 7, that you are fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look atop... Uh, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Senor and Hermon, from the lion's dens, and from the mountains of the lepers. And even though, you know, in chapter 3, there was sort of this uh, shunning of the bridegroom, and I believe in chapter 3 it's because of, of ignorance. You know, she just did, wasn't uh, thinking about what she was doing. He still is bestowing on her these words of love and affirmation. And again, Romans 8, 1. I hope you all memorize this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Lord doesn't condemn us. What can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord? And, and so the bridegroom speaks these words of affirmation uh, to the bride, as does our bridegroom, speak words of affirmation and love and acceptance to us. And sometimes we want to sell ourselves a little short and say, well, I'm really not all that. We're not apart from Christ, but in Christ, in Christ, in the beloved, you know, he looks at us as pure and spotless. Let that sink in a little bit. That's why I like you to read the Song of Solomon and just meditate on the things that he affirms in her. And then notice in verse 8, the invitation to come and be with him. Does that remind you of anything like Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 or Revelation 3.20? In the New Testament, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man open the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. And here I, I just see in verse 8 the invitation of the bridegroom saying, Come with me. Uh, this invitation to come and be with him. Verses 9, 10, and 11. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair 
is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. You know, and, and speaking now of his great love and appreciation for this woman as she invite he invites her to be with him and i just sense the lord speaking to us come and be with me for a while i love you i love you so much my love is 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 better than wine you know and we find other passages and that talk about his love being unconditional and never ending and we never understand the, the fullness of the love that Christ has for us. You know, there's another Old Testament prophet who said that one day he will rejoice over us with song. I love to sing my worship songs to the Lord. But I cannot even in my wildest imagination imagine the Lord singing his love song over us the bride. And we begin to see in the Song of Solomon just a, a picture. Then in verses 12 through 15 uh, of chapter 4, he talks about the, the garden, a garden enclosed. And I, I, I listened to a great sermon called My Life, His Garden. Uh, just about inviting the presence of the Lord. For those of you who haven't been with us, uh, I'll, I'll repeat this. The, the, the great preachers of past had such a high reverence for the book of Song of Solomon. It was Spurgeon's favorite book. 88 sermons, sir, I'll get it right, 88 sermons Spurgeon preached from the Song of Solomon. They said it was D.L. Moody's favorite book uh, because of the way they looked at it as the love of God in Christ to them and to the church. And you can go back and read through church history the enormous amount of sermons that have come out of the Song of Solomon even in the Christian church. And this one was a good one that I listened to, uh, My Life, His Garden. Uh, and in verses 12 through uh, 15, this is still uh, the beloved speaking. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Fragrant henna with spikenard. Spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon. With all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes. With all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. And all I can think about you know, is, is we're going through the Gospel of John on Sunday morning. And we just finished a week ago, John chapter 7. I don't know if you remember it or not. But Jesus, on the last day of the feast, stood up and cried out, if any man come after me, what does the rest of the verse say? Out of his innermost being shall gush rivers of living water. And this he spoke of the Spirit. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. A well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. You don't know what the Lord wants to do with us, in us, because of his love for us, if we just come to it. And let him express his love for us. So the Shulamite, uh, the woman, will respond in verse 16. Awake, O north wind. O oh, come, O oh, south, blow upon my garden that the spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Again, I'm reminded of John chapter 15. You know, that it's the Lord's will that we bear much fruit. And let the Lord come to our life and do his work so that pleasant fruit flows from our life. Let the Lord come and partake. And I'm reminded of when Jesus was coming down the Mount of Olives. And he came across a fig tree 
that was barren and had no fruit and he was looking for fruit. Now we know there's probably a, an analogy of the nation of Israel when he was coming down the Mount of Olives and the fig tree becoming a symbol of the nation, him looking for fruit and not finding it. We find in Isaiah chapter 5, the story of the vineyard and the owner of the vineyard comes what? Looking for fruit. So it's easy to see how the Jews would make the analogy that this is about Israel. The Lord comes and he wants to find the fruit that is in us. Chapter 5. I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with milk. You know, so he's now speaking to her about coming to her. And then he invites his friends in the last part of verse 1. Eat, O oh friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O oh beloved ones. Now, the remainder of chapter 5, I find very interesting. Because here is the bridegroom expressing his love and his affirmation for the bride. Here she is anticipating his coming. Thinking about all the pleasant things that would be involved when her bridegroom comes. But in chapter 5, beginning in verse 2, he comes and she doesn't respond. And how often is that the story of our lives? The Lord expresses to us his words of love and affirmation. He sends his invitation for us to come and be with him and spend some precious time with him and experience the joy and the intimacy of relationship with him. I believe that's, a, that's an invitation we get every day from the Lord. In fact, we read last week, I have to go back and look, look see if I can find the verse again. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 2, you know, where the king is saying, rise up. My beloved, you know, and, and of course we made the application that many times in the morning hours, the Lord will come and say, rise up. Let's have some intimate time together uh, before the day starts. And in chapter 5 here, we find that the bridegroom comes, but she is sleepy and doesn't want to get out of the bed. So let's look at verses 2 through 5. Because I think this is a picture a lot of times of us when the Lord comes. He, in verse 5, he, uh, chapter 1 of verse 5, he says, I have come to my garden. And in verse 2, she says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew and my locks with the drops of night. He had been out all night, you know, and, and, and she was wondering when he was going to come. And, and now he comes. But she's asleep, but her heart's awake. And he, she hears him knocking. And she hears his voice. But she responds in verse 3 and says, But I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? That is, I really don't want to get up and come to the door. So my beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. And my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. And my heart leapt up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So what happens is he's knocking on the door. He's saying, I'm here. 
and she says, ah, I'm a little tired. <laughs> I don't want to get out of bed. And then when she gets out of bed and goes to the door, he's gone. Not that the Lord leaves us, but how many times are there missed opportunities when the Lord comes and says, I want to have some intimate time with you. Let's enjoy the intimacy of fellowship. I'm here. Uh, and we have some excuse or some reason why we don't want to immediately respond to that. Uh, only to find that we have missed an opportunity to be with the Lord. And you could sense in verse 6 that, that she had this immediate rising up in her heart when he spoke. But now she goes and he's gone. And so she called, but he gave no answer. In verse 7, the watchman who went about the city found me. That is, she had gone out now seeking, searching uh, for her uh, bridegroom. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil from among me, from away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, please tell him that I am lovesick. Now, I know we're trying to look at the allegory of uh, the Song of Solomon. And there are many sermons that begin in verse 1 about the bride being made up of many, but yet one. When he invites the friends to come. You know, that the bride of Christ is made up of all believers, which make one bride. And then the analogy they use from that is the watchmen uh, in verse 7 uh, have gone about the city and struck me. Uh, and the application they tend to make from those sermons is that how often in the church we as the bride will wound and hurt others uh, for whatever reason who are also the bride of Christ uh, by the things that we say and the actions that we take. And I think that's a pretty cool application. Uh, if the Song of Solomon is an allegory about the, the bridegroom and the bride, it's not just individual. It is made up of the body of Christ. And we need to be careful how we're treating others that are also the bride of Christ. Um, I've got a lot to learn. Like I said, I've been walking with the, with the Lord for 50 years. I love to sit back and think about how much the Lord loves me. And I like to look at verse 4 of chapter, I mean chapter 7, chapter 4, verse 7, when the Lord says, You are fair, my love. And there is no spot in you. I love to sit back and say, man, the Lord just looks at me and he sees me as, as the perfect bride of Christ. And I rejoice in that. But this guy over here, he, he sure needs some work. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? You know, we're all the bride of Christ. And wouldn't it be nice if we would show and, and demonstrate that same kind of affirmation to other people? that are part of the bride of Christ. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't confront sin. We should. But so oftentimes, we, we are quick to judge where other people are uh, in their walk with the Lord. And, Why can't you get it together? Why can't you just, you know, and, and we say all these things to other people when really they are the bride of Christ too. Corporately, we're the bride of Christ. And when the Lord looks at them, what does he see? He looks at them and he says, you are fair, my beloved. I see no spot in you. Kind of reminds me of what Paul says in the book of Romans. That we are not to judge another man's servant. For he'll either rise or fall before his master. So now she is, she is broken hearted because she's missed this opportunity for intimacy with the Lord. Or with the king. They respond to her charge in verse 9. Where, what is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? 
What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? And so she responds in verses 10 through 16 about how wonderful she thinks he is. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest uh, gold. His locks are wavy and black as raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. I think we sang a song about that. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And when I read verses 10 through 16, I think about songs like, Fairest Lord Jesus, and things that we sing that talk about his beauty, his wonder. Uh, we even sang one tonight, what a beautiful, wonderful, powerful name. And back in the day, we used to sing a, a song, His Name is Wonderful. And, and I see this as our expressions of love and adoration uh, to the Lord. Uh, I'm not a big fan of a lot of contemporary worship songs because I think their theology is pretty shallow. Some are pretty good. But for the most part, I think our worship ought to be directed toward the Lord, expressing who he is, our love for him. Uh, and this is what she's doing. She's just telling these people, you won't believe how amazing he is. And she begins to describe him. Almost makes me uh, want to play uh, S.M. Lockridge. I, I can't describe him. Uh, I can't describe him. You know, we try to describe the wonder and awe of Jesus. And we ought to be talking about how awesome he is. You know, the words of Warren Wearsby haunt me. It says, we have lost the wow of our worship. We no longer stand in awe of the one that we worship. And that's what she's doing in verses 10 through 16. She is expressing, she's telling, she's telling folks, let me tell you how wonderful he is. I can't describe him, but let me tell you how wonderful he is. Then in chapter 6, where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? I love that. The way she described the awe and wonder of the one she loved caused other people to want to go with her to find him. Does our conversation about Jesus get other people so excited that they want to join in and seek him? She knew exactly where he had gone in verse 2. My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flocks in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. That was part of the song we used to sing back in the day, with the full gospel businessmen. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. He brought me to his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. You know, uh, think of all the songs that we have uh, come up with out of the Song of Solomon that express more than just a love relationship between a man and a woman. He feeds his flocks among the lilies. And the remainder, the biggest part of chapter 6 now, remember chapter 5, he comes, he knocks on the door, he calls her name, she doesn't want to respond immediately. She delays a little bit, comes to the door. Finally, he's gone. It breaks her heart. Where did he go? She goes out and searches for him. 
And, you know, I think if you've ever left a place of intimacy with the Lord or let it slide by and you long for it, there is a seeking that should come after that. Where is that intimacy? Where, where can I get that place of intimacy with the Lord? And I think sometimes we just want to throw up our hands and say, well, it's lost now. Jeremiah said, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. I think we miss the whole heart part of that. You know, and this, this Shulamite now uh, misses the opportunity to spend some intimate time with the bridegroom. And now in sort of desperation, she's out looking for him and asking other people to, to come with her and search. Who is he? What makes him so special? She begins to describe how special and wonderful he is. And they too want to find the, the bridegroom. Well, in verse 4 of chapter 6, the beloved, or Solomon, begins to speak now about the Shulamite. And notice he doesn't say in verse 4, well, you missed the opportunity. You blew it. He says, oh my love, you are as beautiful as Tirzah, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. So what does he do when she begins to seek him and long for him again? He immediately affirms her, doesn't condemn her, doesn't chastise her for missing the opportunity to be with him, but once again affirms his love for her. Now, if we come to the Lord and we've missed opportunity, we tend to beat ourselves up because of the missed opportunity. And the Lord looks at us and he says, you know, I love you. I don't love you because and I don't love you if. I love you. And that's what he's doing to her now is affirming his love. And, and now verse 8 just seems sort of out of place with the rest of the book of Song of Solomon. For he says, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. You know, so even at this early stage in Solomon's life, he already had 60 wives and 80 concubines uh, and virgins without number. Now we know from 1 Kings that he ended up with 1,000 wives and concubines. But at this point... You know, he's, he's focusing in on the Shulamite. Verse 9, my dove, my perfect one, is the only one. The only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines, they praised her. Who is she who looks forth at the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? I went down to the Garden of Nuts. I read one commentary. He said, if this is an allegory about the, uh, Christ and the church, what a great way to refer to the church, a Garden of Nuts. <laughs> I went down to the Garden of Nuts to see the verdure of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was even aware... My soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. And then the chapter ends with the invitation again. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. And she responds, what would you see in the Shulamite? As it were, the dance of two camps. You know, so even in her 
willful ignoring of the coming of her prince, he still affirms her and invites her. And I want to end with this. It doesn't matter, you know, so much how much we've messed up this week because we all have. And the scriptures are clear that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of most of those sins and cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness. Is that what the, what the verse says? I like the words, the Greek words there, all. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And again, you know, we, we mess up. We say, oh, I, I blew it again. Oh, Lord, for another opportunity. God, for another opportunity. And all he says is, but you don't know how much I love you. And we're cleansed again of unrighteousness. This is a love story. And yeah, there are some, some very practical things in here about the marriage relationship. That's why the Jewish rabbis wouldn't let young men read the Song of Solomon until they got to the age of 30. Uh, there are some things in here that deal with the marriage relationship. And, you know, we could study the Song of Solomon, you know, and talk about the, the intimacy of marriage. But deeper than the intimacy of marriage is the intimacy that the, that the Lord wants to have with each one of us. And all I can say to you tonight, that door is open. And the, the Lord is knocking. And he would love to have some intimate time with you. To express his love for you and his affirmation for you uh, as his bride. So find some time this week to respond to some intimacy. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to know that you love us. And Father, forgive us for, for being so neglectful. Uh, of this love and, and the call to intimacy. Lord, we want to respond tonight. We want to seek you with all of our heart. So, Lord, we pray that uh, as we close tonight and close our Bibles, may our hearts be open and may we really begin to experience, as Paul prayed, the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth of the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we uh, split up into groups of two tonight? If um, Dave, everybody on this side, would go with Mike right here at the front, and Joan and Carol uh, over to where Ashlyn is at, and um, Justin will be glad.